This is what we're going to build tonight. This is the uh, EXF1 circuit kit and the T25 microphone kit. Um, and so uh, when you get the package, it looks like this. Uh, everything's inside that you need. Now, uh, in an effort to make this uh, stream more watchable, um, I've done a few things in advance uh, that I will share with you because it's going to make the, um, it's going to make this uh, go a little faster. Sorry, my setup is a little off now because of issues. So I did, I prepped a few things, uh, something I no, wouldn't normally do. Uh, you could do as you are building one of these, but I laid out the resistors and numbered them so I don't have to go hunting. And I bent the leads and we'll talk about that more in a minute. The other thing that I did was um, I soldered the capsule uh, wires to the capsule because that's fairly tedious to do. And I didn't want to make everyone watch me fumble through that in real time. So what you're seeing here on the left side is the way I rigged it. Basically the secret to tape or to soldering wires is to tape them in place. Um, it's uh, very difficult, relatively speaking, to solder wires because uh, they don't stay where they're put, right? There's some spring tension to the wire itself and um, and basically they don't want to lay where you lay them. And so what you need to do is, is set everything up so it doesn't want to move, tape it down so it can't move. And then at that point, it's really easy to solder. So what you're seeing on the left is that I've got a red wire taped such, in such a way that it's on that center electrode of the capsule. Uh, and then on the right side, the trick there is because that, uh, that terminal on the black wire is vertical. It's poking up from the back of the capsule. I've taped the wire to a... Um, something that stands up. It's basically the, the old saline bottle I use as a uh, solder cleaning and, and, and sort of junk collection cup on the, on the bench. So it's just taped to something, wire hangs down, the bare part of the wire is laying right on the terminal, and then you just touch the solder to it and you're good to go. So those are two of the things I did in advance. The other thing I did was um, I, uh, I sanded the uh, edges of the board. Uh, these come in a panel and uh, the edges are perforated and you don't need to sand them off, but it looks much nicer if you do. Um, in some cases, uh, if you don't sand the perforated edges off, the body might rub when the body comes onto the mic in a tighter fitting mic. I don't think it would happen here, but in some cases those perforated edges could rub. So it's just good practice to sort of sand them off and you can do that with the Dremel tool or a piece of sandpaper. It's as easy as rubbing the edge on there. All right. Do you tin the capsule tabs before soldering? Good question. Um, I didn't. Um, you certainly could. Um, a lot of the wire we supply is pre-tinned, uh, so it's not necessary. That said, it won't hurt anything. Um, and so if you want to pre-tin the, the wires, you certainly can. And when we see the, the transformer uh, wires, um, you know, same thing applies. You could tin them. Uh, these already are. So uh, that's up to you, but good question. Thank you for asking. Um, is the T25 an electorate? Yes, it is. And we'll talk more about the circuit in a, in a little bit. What I wanna do now is talk about the agenda for tonight. So um, we're gonna build a mic. Uh, I'm gonna give it away at the end. And uh, we're gonna talk about how the circuit works, look at a schematic, walk through some of that stuff. We'll talk about mods, um, upgrades, downgrades, um, uh, you know, various ways to change the behavior of the circuit. Uh, some of the changes won't make it better. Um, and it kind of depends what you want, right? There's not, it's not like there's a right answer or a best way to do these things. Um, there are mics that are good for some applications and mics that are good for other applications. And depending on what you're trying to do, you can certainly change the, the behavior of the circuit to facilitate that. So we'll talk about some of those opportunities. Um, uh, agenda. So I talked about what I prepped in advance and uh, now I'm gonna talk about tools. So there isn't a lot. Um, I had a link in the description of the video that got canceled that would have linked to my tools page. So I'll have to restore that later, but we won't use a ton of things. What am I doing here? Um, uh, side cutters, very important. Uh, needle nose pliers, also really important. Um, one of my favorite things is a magnifying glass. Uh, this one is great because it's lighted. It's got an LED in it um, and that's really uh, helpful. So I, I keep one of these almost with me. Um, Small screwdriver, uh, soldering iron, solder, of course. Um, 
what you're seeing over here is a uh, not a required thing. This is a microscope that I've set up just for tonight so we can zoom in on some of the soldering. Um, it's definitely, definitely not required for your everyday build stuff. Uh, it's just something fun to have for right now. So um, tools wise, that's mostly it. We, uh, it's really good to have one of these. This is a multimeter. You don't have to have a fluke. These are expensive, but you can get a $20 uh, multimeter, 20 or 30 bucks on Amazon and they work just fine. So, um, but we'll get to that part later. So that's uh, the talk about tools. Now I wanna to talk about a couple of techniques. Um, actually, I'll check in in terms of questions. Uh, video, you found it. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, you guys found us, thank you. It's, uh, don't know what happened. YouTube killed the stream. Um, what can you do? So let's talk about uh, a, a DIY technique. So, Probably anything you ever build is going to have resistors in it. It's one of the key passive components of, of any circuit. And uh, we use a brand called Dale. Uh, and we like these for a couple of reasons. One is they are um, uh, they're low noise, so 50 parts per million thermal noise. Uh, in a mic that's used at room temperature, that's probably not going to matter that much, but it's nice to have. They're 1% tolerance, which is great. Uh, so you don't need to go to special lengths to match them. They tend to be matched anyway in situations where you would need to match. Now, this mic does not need any kind of matched resistors. In a Shep style mic, um, which we'll have to do a different video about at some point, that mic is basically balanced from the point of the JFET all the way out to the XLR jacks. And so you have two equal output legs, opposite polarity, but equal amplitude. And so it makes sense to have matched things there. And so Dale resistors are really great for that. Um, now, the, thing, the other thing I like about Dale resistors is that they don't use color bands. Uh, a lot of resistors use bands of color that you can decode to determine what the value is. And what I found is that that's a pain in the ass. Like, I don't know what all those codes are offhand. I never learned it, never had to. Um, on, on this brand, they are printed right on the um, right on the part. So there you go, 10K is upside down, I know. But uh, it's printed right on there. And so as long as you can see or have a magnifying glass, then you don't need to be able to uh, decode color bands. So, um, so that's really nice. Now, this also brings us to my next point, which is after you install these, it's really great to have uh, this label be legible um, because if you build the mic or the pre or whatever you're building and it doesn't work, one of the first things you're gonna have to do is go back and make sure you put the right parts in the right place. And if you've installed this, like that, meaning to where you can't read the value. See, if it had color bands on it, you'd be able to read the bands because they go all the way around. But the downside of this, A, it's easier to read um, at the beginning, but once you've installed it the wrong way, meaning so you can't read the label, then you're kind of out of luck. So when we bend these, we always want to bend them so you can read the value afterwards, okay? It's not hard to do. It just means that you bend the leads down from this perspective. So there's a couple ways to do this, and I will demonstrate two different ways to bend resistor leads. Um, and it's actually uh, an important point because if you bend them wrong, then the resistor won't lay flat on the board and you'll have it you know, like standing up from the board in a weird way, which won't hurt anything, but it looks dumb and it's uh, just not professional. So you might as well do a good job, right? Um, leave the, uh, the crappy mic building techniques to the people who make crappy mics, but we're gonna do something better here. So, um, so anyway, the point is you have to bend the leads to fit the, uh, the pads, the, uh, the footprint on the circuit board. So every resistor goes in a certain place. Now, everything that I make uses the same uh, spacing, the same pin spacing for all resistors with a couple of exceptions where we didn't have space for the resistor to lay flat. And so it has to stand up and we have some different values, different pin spacing for the ones that are vertical. But everything that lays flat tends to be at the same spacing. And so once you kind of get a feel for what that spacing is, you can bend the resistors and they'll all be the same. But I'll, like I said, I'll show you two different ways to do it. So uh, so one way, and again, the first thing we do is we orient this so uh, we can see the value. There it is. And then we grab, I'm just using a needle nose pliers here. So we grab the resistor right about there and I am totally eyeballing this, but I've done this a thousand times. It might take you some practice to get this right. Um, or you can use the second technique, which I'll show in just a second. So then you basically just grab it, you hold the body, and you bend 90 degrees, and it's that easy. Okay, the needle nose pliers gives you a nice uh, 
a nice smooth bend. Uh, what you don't want to do, of course, is pull the wire out of the resistor. Uh, you don't want to apply a lot of force. You don't want to get the needle nose so close to the body that you're grinding the coating off, okay? All those things would be bad. Basically, you just grab it right in about there. Again, I'm eyeballing it. And then you bend 90 degrees, okay? So, and uh, as you can see, when this is inserted, you'll be able to read the value afterwards. So the other way, if you're not up for that, would be to take one of these. Um, let's see if I can do, give you a better view of this. So this is basically a resistor lead bending or component lead bending um, device. And I 3D printed this. I downloaded this from uh, Thingiverse, which is a website full of 3D printable stuff. And I printed it and it has a, a bunch of different kinds of spacing on it. Now I know from uh, having used this earlier that the, from my boards, the spacing is just this, it's this topmost notch right here. So um, let me show you what that looks like. So uh, again, we'd want to roll this so that we can read the value, right? So the value is facing up, hold the body down, and then just sort of press both leads like that. And uh, here's the other one, and you're done. Okay, so this the cost on this was, you know, five yards of filament or whatever. So inexpensive tool can be useful. So those are my demo resistors. Now, what we're going to do is take a look at questions. Good question from Jared. If you accidentally have to rebend, is there a risk of the wire just breaking off at some point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, metal will fatigue. So typically you can get um, a, a couple extra bends. Okay, so let's let's do a test. Who knows how this is gonna work? I did eyeball it. So here's me testing, but excuse me, my uh, resistor band. Hey, look at that. So that's what you want. You want that to lay flat, but let's say that you screwed one up. Let's see if I screwed the other one up. Cause maybe that was the one I didn't eyeball. <laughs> that was the one I used the tool for. Okay. So yeah, a little more snug, but that one lays flat as well. Now let's pretend that I bent one a little wide. Um, we'll do one of each. So we'll rebend this one. We're gonna pretend we did this one a little wide. So I'm just gonna straighten it, move this out and bend it wide. And then we're gonna take this one. I don't know if I can bend this uh, closer, but we'll give it a shot. Let's do it like this. Okay, so that's definitely a little tight. So what happens if, if this is, uh, this is what you get is that this is what I was talking about before. It just doesn't want to go in. Now, if this happens to you, what you for sure don't want to do is force it down because you risk breaking whatever the component is. All right. So never, never force components down against the board. Um, let's take a look at the one that's, you know, is too wide. Okay. I mean, it's the same kind of deal, right? It's just not going to go in. So if this happens to answer your question, you can rebend. Now I've already rebent these once. I can probably get one more out of it. Um, what you want to do is straighten the lead. Okay. Now this, this, the new bend you put in is not going to be in the same place, right? So you're not really fatiguing the same spot. Um, so you just grab it a little bit closer and rebend, and then we'll see how we did. So you can get a couple of bends. You know, if you find yourself having to do three or four at that point, I would let it stand up. You know. If you have to rebend it three times and it's still not laying flat, give up and just let it let it sit up a little bit. That's, I mean, it, it doesn't really hurt anything if it's kind of janky like this, you know, like doesn't really hurt anything, looks bad, but. Okay, uh, any other questions? Right on. Okay, so we do need the circuit board. Um, we've got soldering iron. Gonna need a place to dump solder. We've got some solder. Um, what else do we need? Okay, so when I start soldering, I've got an exhaust fan that's gonna be running and it's almost next to the microphone. So it's gonna be loud. I'll turn the volume down a little bit on that. Um, but first we have to place components. Okay, so uh, 
for those of you who haven't seen one of these, one of my kits, these come with a manual. It's like a 30 or five or 40 page manual. This one's a little shorter because it's an easier circuit. So 28 pages. And it goes through literally step by step. So here's, uh, you know, 500 words about how to install a single component. All right. Overkill, perhaps. But this kit was designed for people who have never built one of these before. So this kit doesn't really assume anything about experience or knowledge, with two exceptions. One, you have to uh, know how to solder. Uh, and two, you have to know how to read. <laughs> That's my snarky trade show line about that. Um, the book is pretty comprehensive. Um, if you get one of these, um, I would say um, read through it first. Uh, and also don't just look at the photos. Um, the people who get in trouble with these kits, um, they reach out for support and that's fine. I do all the tech support myself, um, but they get in trouble because they didn't read the directions. And uh, it's a little frustrating for me if they say, well, what about this and that? And I say, well, did you read page seven? You know, So read the book, uh, the words are there for you. Uh, I didn't write them for exercise. I wrote them there because they explain stuff that's important. So um, it, for example, on, in the case of the diode, diodes are polarized. That means they only go in one way. Um, and there's a black stripe. There's a black stripe on the component and there is a, uh, a white stripe on the circuit board that shows you where that black stripe has to lay. So I know this is remedial for those of you who have built stuff before, but for those of you who have not, this is one of the things that you have to watch out for. It's not complicated. In fact, in this case, the circuit board actually says, at least the photo does. Yeah, I did leave it on there. I went back and forth over whether to include help notes on the circuit board, but you can see right there. Um, so step-by-step uh, -step instructions, you don't need to read a schematic. We will look at one later for those of you who are more advanced, um, but you don't need to. You just need to follow the, the directions. Uh, you put stuff where it goes and you solder it down and it talks about how to do all that. And then uh, you plug it in and you got a microphone. That's the idea anyway, uh, we'll see if it works. So uh, I have also pre-bent the diode um, for tonight. So you can see it's got a black stripe on there. So there's only one diode on this board and it goes here. So I align the black stripe on the diode with the white stripe on the circuit board, just like that. So here's a close up of what that looks like. Okay. And by the way, I bent the diode so you can read the last part of the numbers, the, uh, the model number, which in this case is 242, it's, or sorry, 252, I had it right the first. So 252, um, a little hard to read there, but anyway. So that goes in like that. So the stripes are lined up. Did I turn my lights on? Look at this. There we go. All right, 252. Uh, stripes are aligned. So then uh, we start soldering. Now, this is a good time to answer the question that was posted. What's the ideal temp for the soldering iron? Talking about soldering temperature. So I use 700. The key is to be able to form joints quickly. Okay. You don't want to um, hold the iron on the joint for, for too long because heat will kill every component eventually. So if, if you find that it takes you five, six, seven seconds to form a solder joint, that's something's wrong. It could be that your solder is lead free, which is difficult to use. It could be that your iron's too cold. It could be that your iron's tip is not clean, is not conducting well, in which case you should clean it and tin it um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but short answer, 700-ish for the temperature. Okay, so um, my gut sense is I gotta build this thing quickly before the stream dies again. So fan noise is coming. I'm gonna turn my mic down. Um, first, we'll, uh, we'll clean the tip. You guys. Okay, that's audio going down. Here's fan coming on. Um,
All right. So first joint, not my finest work, um, but uh, something else worth pointing out here is that I didn't bend the leads over. So you might see references, uh, instructions that say that when you stick a component in through a circuit board, that you should um, bend the leads over. And yes, that will hold the component on the board, but it also makes for big uh, unruly solder joints that are very difficult to clean. Um, we're not building fighter jets here. Uh, we don't need these things to survive, uh, you know, under uh, multi-G sort of left turns and whatever else happens in fighter jets. But um, something like this, you can leave the wires poking straight up. It doesn't hurt anything. It's easier to solder. It's way easier to remove later. If you decide that you need to fix something or you want to make a change, um, removing solder from a joint where the lead was bent over is very difficult. And... Um, and keeping it clean is difficult too. So anyway, uh, that's what I didn't do is I didn't bend the leads. So um, so that was the diode. That's the first step of the manual. The next one will go more quickly. Uh, so basically we just need to place all these resistors. So let's do that. Um, zoom in here, that is zoomed in. We're going to clip these leads off. Okay, now R3. So um, when we uh, build these, what I recommend you guys do, what I do and what I recommend everyone else do is to install all of the resistors at once. Don't install one and solder it and then install the next one and solder it. And the reason for that is by installing them all uh, together, meaning all at once without soldering, you um, it's, it's like an extra sanity check on whether you've got everything in the right place. Because if at some point later in the process, you go to put in R7 and you look down and you, feel, and you find there's already something in R7, then you know you messed up. So, uh, so this is what I'm doing here. So I'm now looking at R6 um, and I'm double checking values and uh, double checking placement. So R6 was 56K. If we look back here, R6, 56K, R7. Looks like it goes here. 10K. Check that real quick. Looks good. R9 and 10 are both 2.2. Number one. Number two, how are we doing here? Eric says he uses surgical tape to hold components in place while soldering. That's a great idea. Um, I don't know about surgical tape specifically, but uh, one of my favorite DIY uh, tools, and this is one of the things I wanted to mention tonight is blue tape. So on the side of the bench, and if you saw my post on Instagram, you saw that I've got several pieces of blue tape sitting on the side of the desk. This is like a painter's masking tape. So it's, it has not much adhesive on it and the adhesive that's on there doesn't leave residue. And so it's not needed for resistors, but if you have a component and we'll get to that, um, you can tape them down and then turn it over so that they don't fall out. Now, something like this, all of these are relatively flat. So when we turn it over, gravity will hold the board against the components. So we just need to sort of drop this in here, switch back to this, throw some lights on. Okay, now when we're soldering, um, there's a lot of, of stuff here and I, I can't zoom out more. Uh, what I can do is show it more from here. So there's a lot of stuff here. So you just kind of solder from the outside in. Um, and if necessary, we can clip some leads off to give us access to the ones on the inside of the board. So audio down.
Hey, Owen. Great to see you join. Thanks. Um, for those of you who just joined, sorry, it's been such a difficult thing to keep up with this stream. We're, we've been having some serious problems with YouTube where the stream just sort of dies. Um, anyway, so Owen just made a point about tacking down one leg, and we will see that in a bit with the switch. So uh, this is what we've got so far. Um, uh, so yeah, I just soldered everything down. Um, not much to it. So now we trim leads and then we inspect. And it's important to inspect because if something got missed, you'd want to find this out now rather than later. Um, you know, kind of check your work at every step um, is usually the best way to go. So uh, for those of you who don't know Audio Builders Workshop, Check it out. It's audiobuildersworkshop.com. Owen, you can put that URL in the chat if you wish. So Owen does some great work with outreach and education and DIY stuff. And um, uh, I mentioned this in my Facebook post. Um, we did a really cool uh, build. Peterson from DIYRE and Owen and, and I did a uh, co-hosted a DIY build at the Crystal, Crystal Palace, I think it's called, at uh, um, Javits. It was very cool. Anyway, picture a bunch of people in the lobby of this giant convention center building microphones and other things. Peterson had something there and Brewster had a metronome kit, I think. How often do you clean the board at the end? Uh, Gary, we'll look at that at the end for sure. Okay, so, um, so here's what we've got. There we go. So all resistors in place and you can see on this particular board, uh, we're almost done which is really cool because it's been a long stream already. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna try to blaze through the end. Someone asked earlier if this is an electric mic. So let me explain what that means. This microphone uses a capsule that does not need an external power supply. Uh, I don't mean an external box. I mean, it doesn't need a power supply from within the circuit. Uh, the capsule is what they call pre-polarized. Um, and what the, the nice thing about that for this is that it eliminates a handful of components from the circuit board, making this easier to build without really sacrificing any sound quality at all. So that's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. So now we're gonna throw in the switch. So this microphone has an internal pad switch. First thing we do is bend these two leads out uh, straight. And then we're gonna clip them a little bit shorter just cause they're longer than we need. And this is a, a case where we will use some tape to hold it down or tack one leg. Um, so that we can make sure it's seated properly. Okay, so I take a piece of tape, I go like that. Okay, no problem. Um, let me come over here. Yeah, like I said, solder one leg and then check how it's seated. Well, I didn't do that. Normally what you'd want to do, uh, I got lucky here, it's sitting just fine. But like Owen had commented, you could solder down one leg and then um, you have to be careful with the switch. See this front face is, is connected to these two pins. And uh, so what you typically want to do is for this switch is you'd solder one rear leg. And then if it's not sitting against the board, which you can see just if it's kind of standing up from there, you would press down with your finger and then reheat this joint just by laying the iron in there. And, uh, and that will reseat the switch against the board and then you can solder the other ones. With this switch, you don't wanna do that on the front legs because those two front pins are connected to this. So if you're pressing down on that piece of metal and you touch the soldering iron there, it's gonna hurt, okay? But uh, I got lucky with the thing sitting down. So we're just gonna throw these last two joints on. And again, these are not carrying any signal. I'm doing a kind of a hack job on the soldering. Honestly, this is a little, um, trying to manage too many things. So then we clip some leads. All right. So that is our pad switch. Next up is the one gig resistor. So this one's a little bit tricky because it has to stand up. And the reason it has to stand up is that we want 
the high impedance uh, section of the circuit to be not on the circuit board because the uh, if this was laying on the circuit board and the and the capsule wire was also connected on the surface of the circuit board, that would degrade the signal quality. Uh, so what we're going to do is solder one leg of this down and solder the other leg to the switch. And you can see this set up right here. So we try to get good pictures of this because it is a little bit complicated. So we'll bend this over first and then maybe kink it back out a little bit like that. Okay, so we want these two things to intersect here. All right, so at this point we could try to tape this down or if you have a clip, you could try to clip those two together really just to hold it in place. So I'm gonna go with the tried and true blue tape method. All right, then we'll throw Okay, so there's the one gig resistor. Now this lead is longer than we need it to be. It only needs to intersect with this pin right here. Here's a view of that. Okay, so it's much longer than it needs to be. So we're just gonna come in here and snip off the excess. All right. Next up is the JFET. Okay, so we bend that third leg and it intersects with the one gig resistor and the same switch pin. So what's happening here is the switch pin, let's see if our stream is, am I using helping hands or resting the board on the desk? I'm definitely just resting the board on the desk. Um, how do you know if you use too much, not enough solder for the high impedance joint off the board? So um, I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, it, you know, you want enough solder that the connection is made, um, but not so much that the solder joint's touching the surface of the board and not so much that you held the iron on there for like a minute as you're feeding in solder, right? Because heat will kill everything eventually. So you want to form the joint fast. You want to have enough solder that there's a nice little ball that kind of encompasses everything that's on there. So we'll talk more about that in a sec or as we go rather. So, uh, so this is our JFET. Um, pin three of the JFET is the gate. So we bend this, uh, that's the sort of audio input. So I know this not, may not focus, but we're just gonna bend this guy sideways. Again, you don't wanna pull it out of the transistor body. Just wanna bend that thing sideways. And then maybe we'll spread these two pins a little bit so that they can uh, go into the board. I'll make one more comment about this JFET. When we ship a kit, uh, we pre-bias every JFET. So every, every kit we ship has a piece of paper in it that has a resistor value, or in the, in the case of a transformerless SHEP style, two resistor values. Um, in that mic, they form, the resistors form a, a voltage divider that puts the JFET in its, uh, its operational point where it has maximum SPL and minimum distortion. Similar with this, there's only one resistor needed, but this is the resistor that makes this particular JFET do its best work. Um, so, uh, and that's the resistor we already installed. Uh, it was back here at R3. So we just drop this guy in like this. All right. And uh, if you want, I mean, it can sit on top of those other leads or you can try to snake it under. Um, I'm just gonna leave it where it is for right now. And then we're gonna come over here and solder those two leads there at the bottom. All right. Okay, we're gonna, as always, clean and tin the tip of the soldering iron. I've decided to forego the exhaust fan. So if I keel over from lead fumes, the stream will probably end by then anyway, so <laughs> no problem. You know, I usually wear, um, at my advanced age, 
Good Lord. I usually wear one of those uh, magnifying headband things because I really can't see what I'm doing. Um, so forgive me my performance here. There we go. All right, let's see how bad that is. Oops. Did I just do the wrong? No, probably. All right. Okay, so now we trim some leads. Okay, so I've got the JFET on there. Ideally, it would be sitting lower, but I'm in a hurry. So uh, this would be a case where um, we would tack one leg ideally and then sit it down a little more, but you know, we're gonna be okay. Uh, as before, we have excess lead on here. So we're just gonna come in here, see if I can get this to focus and trim off the excess because we just need this to intersect with everything else. All right, what's next? Electrolytics. Okay, so electrolytic capacitors are polarized. That means they only work one way. Now this is marked, uh, the longer lead is positive, the negative lead has a stripe on the outside of the component. You can see that here. Positive leads are marked on the board and negative leads are marked as well. Okay, so you can see the little plus signs there. I can't, but hopefully you can. So they go in this way. And on this circuit board, I've actually put some like help text right on the board too about how those go. And there's also a photo in the manual. And I laid out the board. I laid out the board so that all of these would show the stripe in the same direction. Uh, I try to do that in a lot of kits. Sometimes you can't because it makes leads either really difficult to route or something. But in this case, when it's all right, you'll see the gold stripes all in the same place. And you can see that in the book as well right there. Um, this is the world's slowest lens. There you go. So uh, we're going to tack those down. And this is a case where I will remember to uh, solder one lead of each and then check the height. Where are we? All right. kind of ironic that you people, folks who are watching this can see what I'm doing better than I can. All right. So I'm trying to tack down one of each, one lead of each electrolytic. You know, the other thing that's working against me here is, um, this microscope surface is really slippery. Not to make excuses, but uh, if you were working on a board, you know, like on a mat like this, it would be, nothing would be moving around. Okay, so what I'm looking for here is, you know, I can do it here, is uh, the solder joints, you know, what you typically want. So that one's a little bit funky back there, but in general, um, what you're looking for is a nice, smooth, like a Hershey's Kiss sort of deal. Uh, so I'm doing okay there. Now let's check the component height. Okay, so these are all sitting against the board and that's what you want. Um, in some cases, these uh, will stand up from the board, you know, like there'll be an air gap below the capacitor and that's not what you want, but we're doing okay here. Um, and this particular mic doesn't have clearance issues. You might see it in a small diaphragm microphone. Um, you might see that you don't have um, you know, the body won't clear if the capacitors are standing too tall. So that's not going to be an issue here, but in general, it is a good practice to make sure that the components are um, laying down. So now let's tack the rest of these leads. Is this, this one right there. Wow, that's painful. There we go. All 
So the good news is, <laughs> for all of you less experienced uh, solderers out there, if this mic works, then you can be pretty confident yours will too. So I'm kind of making a mess of this. Sorry, I'm just checking uh, solder joints now. So then we clip leads. Okay. So that's, uh, that's most of it. What's next is the pad capacitor. So this one's a little funky. Uh, this is a little uh, 15 picofarad silver mica capacitor. Um, cool. So, uh, sorry, just reading the comments there. So um, if you have questions, put them in there and I'll try to get to them. So um, this is a, uh, this capacitor will give us an attenuation pad, which allows us to turn down the input signal to the mic. And we'll look at how this works in the schematic a little bit later um, for those who can stick around. Right now, I'm just trying to kind of burn through this quickly. So it needs to be soldered to this other switch lead. So again, we're gonna reach for our blue tape and tape that lead to the switch because then that you can see it, the, the lead sits right on top of where we want it to be. Let me press this down a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna solder this one here because you guys have seen enough up close. Jesus, it's getting fumy in here. Okay, now the uh, this lead only needs to go as far as the switch body. Uh, you know, it just needs to solder to that. So what we don't want to do is clip the uh, <laughs> clip the pin off the switch because then we have nothing to solder to. So we just carefully come in here, do it this way, and go like that. So you see that? Oh, perfect shot. So you can see those. And then to get those together, we can just take this, kind of mash them together a little bit. Okay. And then, and this is someone asked earlier about how much solder you need. I think it was like an off the board kind of question. So we'll just see how that works here. Ooh. You ever notice how solder fumes always come straight for your face? Okay, I think I got it. It's a little awkward. Yeah, let's take a look here. Yeah, look at that. Okay, so not a ton of solder. For sure, not too much. Okay, now we left this joint open. The uh, See those three leads there in the middle? Um, the one gig resistor, the JFET gate, and the switch pin. We're gonna solder those later when the capsule wire is available. So now we come back to here. Uh, we do a review, right? I'm gonna call that done. Uh, then we would clean the board. Now I am going to um, demonstrate this really quickly. So this is my favorite way of uh, cleaning the circuit board. <laughs> Sorry. I'm I'm going to put on some rubber gloves here, of course. Tonight is not the night. All right. So uh, we're going to forego the rubber gloves, too. And um, what we do is we take alcohol. And this is 99% uh, uh, isopropyl. 91% would also work. Um, due to the pandemic, alcohol can be hard to find. Um, so uh, there's also commercial flux cleaners that would work. What we do here is 
we take a, a paper towel that is, has been wet with whatever solvent it is. And I would do recommend wearing rubber gloves. Uh, and then you just rub the back of the board like this. And what's happening is the paper towel is getting shredded and making a mess, but all those little bits contain flux and contamination that we don't want on our microphone. So you just rub in both directions and let that paper towel sort of wear itself away. Okay. Now, if you haven't trimmed your leads enough, uh, let me show you what I've done and I might need to tune some up here. Then you'll get bits of paper towel stuck on there, which is not ideal. So we'll grab a brush and brush that away. Or maybe some compressed air would work. Um, we do have some compre. And then you take a brush. That was hard to see. <laughs> okay, and then we do a quick inspection. So you can see the leads are fairly short. Um, typically, you don't want to see stuff like this. That solder joint, I'm not proud of. The solder should cover the pad. I'm not sure if that tip's getting older. Ball of solder sitting on top of the board, that would be typically a cold solder joint. Um, that lead there is potentially a little bit long, this one right here. I could trim that one a little more. Um, you don't need to see like wire sticking up past the end of the solder joint. That won't help anything. Um, and, and if you don't trim your leads long enough, then this, this process of scrubbing with this um, won't work well and you could hurt your finger actually, you know, if the wires are poking through this and attacking your fingertip. So now that the board is clean, we wipe this up. Okay, so that was the defluxing step. Capsule wiring, good news is we can skip that step. The capsule installation. All right, so then we take our mic body, uh, check in with the YouTube hates the microscope. Yeah, it could be. Um, my, yeah, my stream is still frozen. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me and see. I'm just gonna keep going because it's getting late. So uh, the capsule goes on like this. So um, we take screws and these are included with the, uh, the capsule and the mount. Okay. okay, that's one. Sometimes um, if you have bigger hands, um, it can be really hard to put a tiny screw into a microphone. They're, they're, it can be tight quarters. So uh, one of my other favorite DIY tools is a good pair of tweezers, which I didn't even lay out on the bench for tonight, but um, those can sometimes be really helpful for placing small screws. Okay, so capsule mounted. And in this case, we want the front of the capsule to be pointing towards the tab. Okay, then we route our wires through the holes like so. This mount is a little bit wonky, but the cardioid logo would go to the front. Okay, so there's that. And this is this is one of those places where I sometimes struggle to get the screw in because um, it's sitting down below the rim of the head basket. Okay, so that's one. So we're in the home stretch now. Okay, there's that. Now we've got uh, we've got to throw the transformer together. So this is pretty easy. Goes through like that. So we include the zip ties, and these circuit boards are custom made to have uh, 
to fit everything really nicely. So I um, haven't seen any new comments in a while. Looks like it's still working. You mentioned soldering wires on a capsule. Any tips to avoid a drip or bumping or burning the capsule? Yeah, don't don't burn the capsule. That's my tip. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if you're working with a capsule, what you don't want to do is hold the soldering iron right above the diaphragm, because why take the risk? Um, let's do away with this guy. So I'm just zip tying the transformer to my transformer carrier. Okay. So we'll stop at the one because it doesn't matter for this purpose. So typically you'd want the circuit board to be on the front of the mic. Uh, the XLR3 pin, which is this one, would be towards the back. And because we know we put the capsule in properly, um, we know this is the front, right? The, the grill went on the right way. And so um, audio circuit board would go here. So you know what I'm gonna do first actually is uh, do some of this soldering. Let's do this. So we're gonna throw those um, transformer wires on first. So I think these are color coded. Yes, but not in the silk screen. Okay, so the back of the board is marked with um, the legend, which is nice. So you don't have to keep turning it back and forth to see what goes where. So this is going to go on the front. This guy is going to go on the back. Okay, so the book tells us exactly how to wire this. So red to TP1, gray to TP2. So red goes to TP1. I think that's that one. Here we go. Gray goes to TP2, which is that one. So we are going to give this mic away at the end of the broadcast. And I um, appreciate all, the, all of those of you who have stuck around this long. I'm really kind of bummed about the um, technical problems that we had. So if you need to exit, uh, you know, no stress. I know it's getting late. I know we had some folks here from England early on. It's like four in the morning already over there. Uh, yellow to TS1. So I'm going out of order here a little bit from the manual. Um, it's going to work either way. Uh, and then orange to TS2, which is up here. So you don't want to solder wires incorrectly. I always want to double check that you've got the right one in the right place. Okay, then we come back and trim leads. All right. So that's the front of the mic, that's the back. So we're just gonna feed this guy through. So he's ready to go. Now we'll jump back into the manual and um, throw our capsule wires in. So the black wire goes to, red wire goes to the input joint and the black wire in the corner there goes to the BP joint or what is, what is it marked? CG for capsule ground. All right, so we can take this black wire Okay, feed it right into that 
solder pad. And because wires like to jump around, um, I usually solder them one at a time rather than place them all and then figure out that they've moved or popped out. Here's another trick is using a, a, a hand tool to prevent the mic from rolling around. Now on this wire, what you don't want to do is have the insulation poking through the hole. Okay, you want the wire to be coming through the hole, but not, you know, not the insulation. And so that's what I just checked. And here's an example where you wouldn't want to clean your soldering iron right on top of the microphone where the flux or solder could drip through the, uh, the grill onto the capsule. Uh, it's best to keep the capsule uh, covered or safe if you can, or at least solder somewhere else, meaning not right on top of it. So here's, we're gonna come in on this guy. So the iron should be on the pad as well as on the wire. Put that in there. It's really hard to see. Yeah, look at that. Now for the capsule input, um, this is where having a pair of tweezers can be handy. So, something like this. So soldering this input wire, this capsule signal wire, is probably the hardest step of building this entire microphone. So here I'm going to try to angle this board kind of back and out of the way so that the wire can come into this joint. And the thing, the reality of this, and this is why I soldered the capsule wires ahead of time on the capsule, is because it can take five minutes of fiddling to get the wire where you want it. It only takes a second to solder, but that's after you've done all the hard work of, um, all the hard work of placing it, right? So uh, don't rush this. I mean, you know, do the soldering part quickly, but do the placement part slowly, because if you get this wrong, it, uh, it's much worse to do it a second time. So what I, what I try to do, and it's better if I can actually see what I'm doing, is wedge the bare end of the wire into the joint so that it stays. Yeah, I'm not gonna have any luck, I'm sure. There are alternate ways to do this, and I might have to break one out if I can't get this in a second because it's a little painful to watch. Uh, the other thing that you could do would be to solder the joint, and then once the solder is on there, you just heat it up and then sort of plunge the wire into it while the heat's on there. So you're basically reflowing the joint Got it. Look at that. Yeah. So we had three wires. Um, I don't know if you can see this. So like three different components coming together there. And I just sort of wedged the capsule lead in the middle of it. Then we want to heat the joint and then solder the whole thing all at once. Hello, oh, I missed. And you want to get enough solder in there that everything gets encompassed. So at risk of offending the YouTube gods, should I go back to the microscope? No. Let's, uh, let's do this. Come on, focus. There we go. All right. So I'll come back later and, and trim off the excess leads because uh, you don't need that extra metal poking around in there. It's not going to hurt anything for right now. So that's our two input joints. Now we can connect this board. 
I'll just throw in one screw. Sorry, I'm off camera here. Okay, so that locks our board down, so it's not gonna go anywhere. Now, um, XLR wires, here's the thing. They are color coded, but you never know that everyone did it right. Meaning at the factory, did they put the right color in the right place? So I never go by color. What I do is I go by uh, where they're coming from because the, the important thing is what pin it is. Pin one is ground. So if you try to connect signal to that, the mic's not gonna work right. So pin one is this one up here. And when I look at this one, it looks black to me. Okay, so pin one is here and you have to sort of mentally reverse that image. So there's one, it's black and two is red. Okay, and three is white. Okay, so we find our XLR1 pad, which looks like it's kind of right in the middle of the board there, XLR1. And we said XLR1 was black. So we take a pair of uh, tweezers. So I'm going to tell everyone the URL for the uh, feedback form because I would love to get some feedback. I know we had some technical issues, but even beyond that, uh, what I want to know is if we should do more of these. Um, you know, this kit is uh, easier to build than most, believe it or not. Um, and so some of the other kits you couldn't build in, in, a, in a broadcast. It would just take too long. It's better if, you know, to be filmed in advance and then sped up like the tutorial video. We have a tutorial video of the S25 that is done, was done that way. So, um, but if you have requests for other things we could do, I would love to hear that. And the URL is going to be mikeparts.com slash entry. Uh, that is also the entry form for the mic giveaway. So um, I'll put that in chat when I have a free hand. That's XLR1. Something looks funky there. Oh, I made a mistake. All right then. Uh, now XLR2 is, uh, we said was red, yeah? So I just noticed something um, that would have prevented the mic from working. So we need to reflow one of the transformer wire joints. So we'll have to grab that before we, before we fire this up. And what happened, it looks like, is the exact thing I was warning about before, which is the insulation poked through the hole, which I didn't think would happen on the transformer wires, but XLR2, get in there. Okay, XLR3, of course, is the one that's left. And it's white and it is left. And uh, and the one pad that's left is XLR3. So that part worked out. Tweezers. Okay. XLR3. You know, actually, in the interest of time, I know some of you want to see if this mic works. Um, I would have to come back and fix this. I don't know if you can see this joint right there. Um, the TP2 joint, you can see it looks kind of funky. Uh, the insulation pressed through, so I'll have to back that out. Unfortunately, I cut it off. I'm going to have to back it out, trim it in. And, um, do that. So what we're going to do instead is move on to we're going to move on to um, some of the other stuff I wanted to talk about because I think that's probably what some of you were waiting for. Uh, getting a 404 on mikeparts.com slash entry. Interesting. Let me uh, try this.
Oh, you know what? It's enter. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's not microphone parts either. It's going to be. Let's see if that works. Yeah. So let me paste this in uh, so you guys can click on it. There we go. So that's that's the feedback URL and the entry form for the sign up. So now let's uh, you can see the schematic. Yes. So this is the the uh, Neumann KM84 schematic. Now you don't need to read this to build this mic, uh, but this is where this microphone came from. We're not going to talk a lot about that because as you can see, this one is much more simple. This is what we actually just built. So not a ton of components. Um, the capsule is here on the left. Okay, that's the capsule. Signal flows basically from left to right. Here's the transformer, and over here are the XLR output pins. Um, so we're going to talk not a lot of, uh, about everything, but let's focus on the signal path. So this is actually where audio goes. Um, okay, so audio goes in the capsule, uh, obviously, and then it goes to the JFET. Uh, in a lot of microphones, you'll see a capacitor between those two points, um, but nothing here. Okay, uh, this is what's called direct coupled. If there is a capacitor between those two points, uh, sometimes that needs to happen to prevent DC voltage from hitting the JFET uh, or the tube, whatever might be there. Uh, but there's nothing here. So, um, you know, in a lot of microphones, that would be the first thing you want to upgrade within the circuit. Uh, the capsule, of course, is usually the first thing you want to upgrade. But uh, the input coupling capacitor would often be something to, to upgrade, but there isn't one here. You know, the best capacitor is no capacitor at all. So good there. So the signal goes from the capsule to the JFET to C4, which is a capacitor. Um, that's the output capacitor, and then to the transformer, and that's it. Okay, so those four parts are the signal path of the microphone. And everything else that you're looking at is kind of support, right? It's stuff to make voltages happen and other components do their thing. So if you ever wanted to talk about upgrading uh, one of these, you'd probably want to focus on these couple of components because these are the ones that you actively hear. Now, there are a couple of other parts that are worth talking about. Uh, but let's talk about uh, a, a pattern that you'll see. This is like uh, mic circuits, you know, not 101, but maybe 102, second semester. Um, uh, let's talk about RC networks. Okay, so an RC network is a, a passive filter. It's used a lot in all kinds of circuits to filter noise out. Because uh, just as an example, anytime you want DC, uh, a, a DC uh, amount of power, like a DC power supply, uh, DC is zero hertz. Okay, but in a lot of cases, you're going to have higher frequencies riding on top of that, which could cause problems. So if you're powering, uh, your, if you're powering your JFET, for example, with DC, but there's some AC noise kind of superimposed on that and is going into the JFET, that can't be a good thing. Okay, that's going to interfere with, with everything. And so uh, what you see a lot, a pattern that you're going to see a lot is a resistor uh, followed by... Um, a capacitor that's connected to ground. So that's what's circled here. So uh, R7 and C5 is an RC filter. And so basically what's happening here is uh, you've got power being collected here and it goes along here. Now it hits uh, this diode, which is basically conducting anything above 24 volts. So at this point you're seeing about 24 volts or a little bit less. And then it runs into this RC filter, which is filtering noise out of the JFET's power supply. All right. And this screenshot here at the top is from a website. You can Google uh, something like you know, RC network calculator or RC low pass filter calculator, and you'll find a number of websites. This is from one of them. And if you plug in the values that we're using here, 10 microfarads as the capacitor, that's C5, and then 10K ohms, uh, 10,000 ohms, uh, which is the, um, the value of R7. You can see I've plugged those in there and you get a, you get a, a cutoff frequency of 1.5 hertz, which is pretty low because DC is zero. So we're, we're way down there. And the kind of noise we're filtering isn't two hertz or something. It would be much higher. And, um, and furthermore, if there was noise at two hertz or something, you probably wouldn't hear it because you'd be filtering that in your DAW anyway. So that's a pattern to watch out for. Um, you can uh, drop that cutoff frequency by raising the resistor value or raising the capacitor value. And there's it's it's not there's always trade-offs uh, as your as your resistor gets bigger it's going to affect uh, voltage drop and, uh, and and other things so um, you can't just uh, arbitrarily pick values out of the air 
um, in a lot of cases. But the point of this is that this is a, a pretty effective RC filter. At the bottom, it shows what was used in the original KM84. Of course, they were a little bit space constrained because the microphone was that big around. Um, so, but this is what we have here. So that's one thing I wanted to share. And then um, let's talk about mods as well. Um, Cause I think this is probably what a lot of people uh, stayed this late for. <laughs> so um, as I said before, the signal path is, is pretty simple. Okay, just those components. So if you were going after changing the sound of the mic, this is what you'd look at. Capsule, uh, JFET, maybe actually not so much, uh, output cap and transformer. Now let's talk about what some of those things will do. Now in general, in a condenser mic, the capsule determines the frequency response. So if you wanted to use a different capsule, you probably get a different frequency response. And so if you're familiar with the large diaphragm mic kits that I make, there's a K47 capsule, a K67 style capsule, and a CK12 style capsule. They all sound different. And that's the reason we use all three is because they sound different. And you can use those to get different kinds of sounding microphones. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what you want is sonic diversity. You want a mic for every voice. You want a mic for every guitar. And changing the capsule is one way to do that. Now, in this particular microphone, there aren't a lot of great electric capsules out there. Um, so in this particular mic, changing the capsule is not really a great option. There are a lot of smaller capsules out there, but smaller capsules will always be noisier. So that's probably not going to help you. Um, JFET doesn't really affect sound very much. There are could be some distortion characteristics that might change, but uh, honestly, changing the JFET is not a great DIY exercise because two reasons. Uh, the amount of sonic change you're going to realize is minimal, and number two, it's difficult to bias them properly. And I talked before about picking the right bias resistor to set up the JFET for its best operation to maximize SPL and minimize distortion. Um, we do that with a custom signal injection rig, uh, which is here. So, um, where is it? There you are. So, uh, signal goes in, signal goes out, different modes here, pot on the front. Um, that's what we use to bias JFETs. Uh, basically, it's a microphone in a box, and we're uh, sweeping through different values of this R3 resistor here in order to find where the JFET is operating optimally. Okay, It's difficult to do at home because you need a signal injector and analysis software uh, this doing like a Fourier transform or you need an oscilloscope. There's different ways to do it, but it's not a, an easy Saturday afternoon DIY thing. So let's not go there. Now let's talk about what might make sense. C4 is the output capacitor. Um, in general, uh, this is where you'd put the fancy capacitor if you had one. Let's talk about this. So these are some mod options. I'll go through all these. So uh, you can, so this particular microphone has pretty much unfiltered low frequency response. Let me say that a different way. Many microphones will filter the low frequency output. This one kind of doesn't, um, which could be good or bad. If you want to build a mic for low frequency sounds, this is great. If you're having a lot of problems with rumble, then this might not work to your advantage. Um, excuse me. Um, so, uh, now, in practice, this particular circuit has a relatively flat frequency response. And I'm, I'm talking about the microphone, I'm talking about the circuit. The circuit itself has a flat frequency response with any value of C4, this is the output cap, down to about 0.1 microfarad. What we're using here is a 10 microfarad, which is a lot bigger, uh, 100 times bigger. Um, the reason for that is that this uh, this makes it easy to build, right? There's four capacitors in here. They're all the same. They're all facing the same direction. Um, and so, uh, and, and I thought this capacitor sounded really nice as this output capacitor. Um, but the output cap of this entire mic is one of these, which, whichever one of these is labeled C4. So if you were going to pursue some kind of audiophile mod, whoops, then that is one of the things you might want to look at. You could certainly go with a smaller value. Um, you don't need to go with a smaller value, but the reality is if you're going to upgrade this, you'd probably end up with a, a fancy film cap of some kind. And film capacitors are much, 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 much bigger than electrolytics, okay? This is a 10 microfarad cap. A 10 microfarad film cap wouldn't fit inside the microphone. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty true. I think you literally couldn't fit inside the microphone. So, uh, but you could use a small, smaller value without really losing any low end. So you could use something down to 0.1 microfarad, and you could find a 0.1 microfarad film cap that fits in here. So that's an option. 
Um, beware of long leads. If you were to go out and find a big axial film cap, of which I have thousands just out of reach that I can't show you, um, uh, it, it wouldn't fit easily in here. And so what you'd end up with is, uh, you know, stuffing it back behind the mic somehow and then having long wires that go around to where it has to plug in. I, I really don't recommend that. Um, long wires can act like antenna uh, and, and you don't want an antenna inside your microphone. So, um, so that's something to watch out for. Uh, what else do we have? Um, transformer. So you could certainly swap the transformer. Now this circuit will work with any transformer with a turns ratio of about six on up as high as you wanna go. The higher the ratio, the higher the turns ratio, the lower the microphone's output will be. So, uh, so you, and you don't need to go any higher than about 10 to one. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of commercial choices in that range from six to nine or 10 uh, to one, the turns ratio being, you know, six to nine, six to one, up to nine to one or 10 to one. Uh, what you need to be careful of is that most transformers are not linear with respect to frequency. Often they're rolled off on the top or they're rolled off on the bottom. And as a mic designer, what your job would be is to figure out if that roll off complements the sound you're going for, the capsule you're using, the capacitors you're using, and uh, the kind of mic that you want to build. So, um, if you have a really bright capsule, maybe you want a transformer that's rolled off on the top uh, or vice versa. If you have a capsule that's kind of thin, you know, then you certainly don't want to have additional low frequency filtering coming out of your transformer. Most transformers that I've tested are not linear from across what we consider to be the audible range, you know, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Uh, they tend to have a roll off somewhere. And so you need to figure out if that's going to work for you. The transformer that's in here that we use uh, uh, works really nicely with this circuit. So we've sold a bunch of these. We've gotten a lot of great feedback. Um, so, uh, the other, the other aspect of transformer performance to worry about is distortion. Uh, different transformers will have different amounts of distortion, um, that, uh, you can see on an injection sweep. So I've published some of this stuff on the website. I don't have any to show you right now. Um, but in a lot of cases when people prefer this transformer versus that transformer, what they're hearing is more or less of second or third harmonic distortion, and it's hitting them in a way that they like, or they don't like, um, uh, I have yet to find a lab tool that lets me measure the sonic magic that is apparently uh, guaranteed with some brands of transformer. If you read Gear Sluts, and they'll tell you, uh, just buy this brand of transformer and that will magically upgrade your microphone. Never mind if the turns ratio is wrong or the, dis or the frequency response is skewed one way or the other. Um, I don't quite know how to measure audio magic, so I tend not to talk about that. Um, what I do measure is frequency response and distortion characteristics. Um, and consistency and things like that. So um, so those are things to be careful of in terms of transformers. Uh, what else can you upgrade? So uh, there's an optional capacitor in this mic that you can see uh, where the footprint is right here. It's labeled FB optional. And um, that's basically a feedback capacitor. So let's what this does is a really cool thing and it's, uh, it's similar to the pad. So let me show you how this works. You can actually see it on all of these, but here's the clean copy. So, so check this out. So audio comes in from the capsule into the JFET gate and it comes out the JFET drain. That's what D stands for. And the interesting thing about that is that its polarity is reversed at this point. So uh, if, if the, uh, the sine wave or the sound comes in, let's say it's the first part of the wave is positive at the capsule. When it comes off the drain, it's gonna be a mirror image of that. It's gonna be negative. And so, uh, there's a, an optional capacitor you could install here that would take that signal, audio signal, right off of the JFET. Now, this is going right out the back of the microphone, right? This is your output audio signal right here along this rail. So you could take that and go through this little capacitor and feed it back into the input. That's why it's called a feedback cap. Now, because this is reversed in polarity with respect to this, what happens is cancellation, all right? So the audio signal here is coming through at a lower level and the amount that gets through is set by the size of this capacitor. I don't mean the physical size, I mean the value. So if you wanted a feedback cap, it would be a couple of picofarads. It's a very small value. Um, we don't supply this value or this cap with the kit, you can, but you can buy them on DigiKey or Mauser or something like that. So a small value capacitor will feed some of that signal back into the, uh, the input, into the JFET gate, which lowers your output level. It also lowers your distortion because it's the capsule is not pushing the JFET as hard because before the signal gets to the JFET, it's been reduced by the amount of feedback that you've provided, all right? So 
This is a mod that you can make that get, it buys you a little bit more headroom and lowers your output a little bit. The trade-off is that if you are um, a golden ear type, you might not like the sound of it because um, my theory is that there's some timing difference. I've never measured it, but you're taking a signal and you're feeding it back into an earlier part of the signal path. So I suspect that some people can hear some smearing there, just a theory. Uh, what I know is that a lot of, um, a number of high profile microphone res restoration experts will remove the feedback out. First thing they do in a mic that has it, they pull it out um, because they think it sounds better without. So your mileage may vary. The last thing I wanna talk about is C3. It's another one of those big electrolytic capacitors on the board and it sets the, uh, it helps set the um, low frequency uh, uh, output level of the microphone. And so let's look at uh, what this is. So you could think of C3 as a sort of cache of electrons that's waiting to go into the JFET. It's not really in the audio signal path, um, but it stores electrons that are gonna become your audio signal. I mean, it's kind of a rough simplistic way to talk about this. So, um, so a couple of thoughts there. Number one, if you look at the KM85 uh, schematic, this was the Neumann KM85, you can see C3, and, and yes, all of the component designators are the same. I kept them all the same. So C3 in this mic is the same as C3 in the mic we just built. They've got 1.5 microfarads there, and we're using 10. Um, with a 1.5 microfarad value, you're going to have uh, basically a hardwired high pass filter in the mic. So it's gonna be rolled off. I forget what the frequency is. I did measure it once, um, 100 Hertz or so, 100 to 200 Hertz, somewhere in there, you're gonna have a roll off. So if you were building a mic primarily for close applications where you were going to have a lot of proximity effect, that could be a cool thing to do. Um, else? Um, now, because, because that capacitor is in a sense right next to the audio signal path, it's another candidate if you wanted to get fancy and spend a bunch of money and put a big film cap in there. In practical terms, it's gonna be hard because you do need at least, well, more than 1.5 microfarads, right? Probably four or five in the neighborhood of you know, 4.7 to five microfarads. You're not really going to find a film cap you can fit in, at least not in this microphone. You'd have to have a very large mic body to fit something like that. So, um, so that's it for mods. Uh, uh, high frequency rolls onto phase feedback. So I think, I think what you're saying is, um, does that feedback cap create a frequency dependent filter? And the answer is in this mic, no, it does not. That feedback cap is not doing frequency adjustment. It's not doing high frequency roll off. It is feeding a full bandwidth signal back in um, to the, uh, at least as far as the audio band is concerned. Uh, it's feeding a full bandwidth signal back into the JFET. So it's not doing, that feedback app is not doing audio frequency EQ. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the pad switch is doing the same thing. Uh, you, can, you can see that here. This is a, a switch and this is the feedback, sorry, the pad cap that we did install. And so if you don't install the feedback app, which you probably won't because the kit doesn't come with one because I don't think this mic needs it, then the only amount of feedback would be when the pad switch is engaged. If you do, install a feedback capacitor, then when you turn the pad on, then these two add up. And so you're having a larger amount of capacitance causing more feedback and giving you more attenuation, but not EQ. Um, right on. So um, that, is, uh, that is most of what I wanted to cover. Uh, if you guys have any questions, throw them into the, uh, throw them into the, chat and I am going to screw this mic together. So for those of you who insist on sticking around to see if the stupid thing works, I do need to fix that one. Um, yeah, this one, uh, third one down. This wire, for those who missed me, what I said about this, this one uh, went in badly. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to repair this without making a mess of it. Come on. Well, actually, that might have fixed it. Let's see. All right. What got here? Oh, no. That, uh, that did come out. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, that was going to be tough. So, here's what we do. Another very useful tool is the small gauge wire stripper. 
So um, you can strip wire without one of these, but it's easier with. So I'm just gonna get some fresh wire here and then strip off enough. Okay. Now, because things are not going my way tonight, the, uh, the solder pad is uh, clogged up. So we take another one of my recommended DIY tools, and that is solder wick with flux in it. And we cut off the used part. And we uh, lay this. So this has flux in it, which helps the solder to flow. So you lay this on there. And you just kind of roll this back and forth until you see it flow. How'd we do? Yeah, not so good. So this is a, uh, sometimes what you can do is take a little extra solder. It seems to help with heat transfer. So soldering wires is easier if there's a hole, a, a, you know, a solder pad that you can put the, uh, the wire through. Now I'm not gonna have that kind of luck tonight. So plan B is uh, you can surface solder them or maybe just try to wedge it in there. If I had, uh, if I wasn't doing this with an audience, there are tools um, that you can use to sort of plunge the hole out. Um, so what I'm going to try to do yeah, so I've got yeah. I suppose uh, Murphy's law dictated that this would be a challenge. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna be able to get that in there. Let's do it this way. So um, we're, just a reminder and a request, please do go to that uh, URL I posted in chat. It's mikeparts.com slash enter and um, send your comments, your feedback and uh, you know suggestions for, for a future live stream. Um, I know some people have suggested doing like a tube mic build uh, after this little experience. I can't really imagine that that would go very well, good Lord. But, uh, but you know, maybe it could be done in parts. Um, with, with some prep. So anyway, I would love to get your feedback. And uh, if you learned something, let me know. And if, uh, if I didn't answer a question that you were hoping I would, let me know that too. What's for dinner? Yeah. Let's see. So this, uh, I'm going to do something I really don't recommend. What I would recommend if, if this happened to you, <laughs> What I'd recommend is cleaning the solder out of that hole. So I'm, I'm gonna have to clean this up later, but just in the interests of trying to make this thing work, I'm gonna just completely hack this together and try to solder this. Jesus, I'm not getting, I'm not catching a break tonight. Wow. I'm doing no time. Oh my God. Okay, so uh, I'm. Uh, 
going to try this one more time. And if it doesn't come up, then I'm just going to call it. So what I've what I'm trying to do now, because everything else is really not going my way, is to put the wick on the back side as well. So without uh, without time pressure, what you could do is take that audio circuit board out of the mic. Um, it's harder, this is harder to do what I'm trying to do here because it's it's kind of in the dark end of the microphone down there. And um, I could uh, unmount that board and take it out. And that would give me a little more room to get the soldering iron in there and try to work the solder out of that joint. Um, the other thing that's worth repeating is if I was paying better attention when I soldered those wires, I would have seen that um, that the insulation had poked through. And that's what went wrong here is I, I let the transformer wire insulation poke through the holes. When I soldered it, it was not going to be a good connection. Yeah, so I've, I've managed to only clog this thing up completely. So um, I am going to um, fix this. Uh, on my own, I'm going to plunge that hole out and solder this up, and then uh, and then listen to it. And then uh, I hope you've all entered the contest. I've got the URL in there, um, and then uh, I, I will announce the winner after you submit that form. It'll it'll say uh, we'll announce the winner within 24 hours. So um, so yeah, we'll go through those those feedback responses and pick a winner. And uh, one of you will get this mic. I promise it'll be working at that point. Um, and, uh, and that's it. So thank you so much for tuning in. I'm really sorry about the early technical problems. And uh, thanks for sticking around. I really appreciate it. I can't believe we had a really great turnout tonight. So thank you everyone for doing that. And, uh, and I'm out. Take care.